started just for timing. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us um, for another session in our webinar series today. We have a great session planned for you on the great resignation and how you can retain your team with PI. We're very excited to be joined today by a very special guest, uh, Dr. Matt Pepsel, VP of Professional Services at the Predictive Index in Boston. He's also known as the godfather of talent optimization. Matt has over 20 years of experience leading teams and improving businesses around the world as an advisor in the discipline of talent optimization. We're also joined by our founder and CEO at Predictive Success, David Leahy, who has over 20 years of management experience formerly at Microsoft Canada. He's a best-selling author, guest lecturer, and has trained thousands of folks in the Predictive Index. For our housekeeping items today, I will ask that you put any questions you have throughout the session into the Q&A box and all other comments in the chat. We will have a Q&A at the end of the session. But to get us started, uh, we're going to ask that you answer this question on the screen. What do you think are the dangers of the great resignation for your business? Pop your answers into the chat and we'll discuss them at the end of the session. Dr. Matt, over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hannah. I really appreciate it. And thanks everybody for spending some time with us today to talk about a really important topic, the great resignation. So what we're going to do in our roadmap today, we're going to have about uh, 20 minutes, I'd say, of of some of the insights that I can provide for you around the great resignation in the context of everything going on in the world of work. We're also going to share some, some tips, tools, and techniques from Predictive Index and, and some of the tools that you have access to in order to offset the great resignation and its impact that it's unfortunately having on organizations. And then we're going to have some time at the end for some uh, question and answer from you. You know, We want to hear from you and see what's on your mind. Uh, Dave's going to do a moderated session with me where he's got some questions to get us started. And then we'll uh, pick up your questions after that. So let's go ahead and, and just kind of level set here. What we're seeing when we talk about the great resignation, which is the intention of people to leave their organizations for a variety of different reasons, it is a truly global phenomenon. You can see from Canada and from Europe and, and in the States and even my Berg here in Boston, where I'm calling in from today, uh, it's everywhere. And it's, it's a universal phenomenon that's happening. The great resignation is happening for sometimes employees feel like they were not treated so well during the pandemic. Maybe there were changes that took place to an organization's strategy. Maybe their job role changed, the team around them changed. Maybe they just feel like they wanna change. And so there's a lot of different reasons that this is happening. Now, what's really important to point out is that the great resignation is taking place within what I like to call a talent tsunami, the likes of which we've never seen. There are so many different dimensions of work that are being impacted. You can see examples on the screen. I won't read them all to you. But look at the top left is return to work, maybe. You know, we've started to go back to work, we're very excited, but some of that's been, been slowed down or reversed in some cases, all the way through to, let's take a look at the top right, multi-generational workforce. You know, we have for the first time, five generations in the workforce actively today. All of this is surrounding the great resignation, all of which is starting to impact the employee experience. Now, while this is happening, there are a lot of different individuals inside organizations that are having different type of responses. What I find when I do work with clients all over the world is that the line managers themselves are ill-equipped to handle the complexities of the talent situation, right? They didn't go to school to learn these types of things, many of which are, are they're very focused on the business, which is changing and maybe don't have as much of the fluency when it comes to the people side of things. And we find that they lack the tools, the techniques, in some case, the mindset, the skills to deal with it. From HR, we're talking about being understaffed and, and under siege. You could see from the slide before when we talked about that, uh, you know, as a big, big challenge as far as all the different types of talent things that are happening. We see that that uh, HR organizations, sometimes called people operations, uh, the types of talent functions, really, really struggling uh, a bit with this. And then the executives. Many times, you know, we definitely understand that they have uh, expect definitive answers to these unprecedented questions. When are we going to go back to work? What's our policy? What are we going to do about this? And everyone's trying to figure this out. And the executives understand that when we start looking at talent and how it's driving the organization, we need to take swift action. But what should that action be? That's not always as, as clear cut. If we think about the employees themselves, what is the employee experience like? Well, we're seeing an, an attack, if you will, on employee morale, and it affects their likelihood to stay. That's what's fueling this great resignation. 
Uh, and, and this really ranges, depending on the individual employee, from what I would call local factors, experience for that individual person, all the way up to global factors that are beyond any of our individual control. If you take a look at the local factors toward the bottom, lower motivation, fatigue, people have been through a lot. They may be dealing with uh, uh, childcare issues. How do I get to work on time when the schools are being unclear about what my child's requirements are or something like that? All the way through uh, difficulties adjusting to remote and hybrid work. You know, we, we sent workers home when we had to, to try to keep them safe. Some have come back. Some have chosen that they don't want to come back and we end up with a hybrid work situation. Uh, some people are grappling with this and it's, it's causing challenges and, and uh, lack of focus issues, et cetera move toward the top, I won't read all these to you, but when you talk about like the second from the top, fear that the company isn't resilient enough to survive the setbacks. Are we financially secure? Maybe I don't have a direct line of sight to the company's financial welfare or one of our key customers was impacted and now we're having some trouble with one of our biggest accounts and I'm worried about that. All the way to uncertainty generally about health and safety in society at large. These types of things are very real. And when we sent our people home to be safe, they weren't the same when they came back, you know, their, their home lives trickled into their work when they were working remotely. And now that they've started to come back to work, or at least attempted to, then that hasn't fundamentally changed. And we've seen this reversion to sort of core values, health, wellness, you know, uh, work-life balance, family, that's definitely showing up in the workplace. So all of this is taking place as, as sort of a backdrop. The inevitable result, as we know on this call, because most of us have familiarity with this concept, this framework of talent optimization, is that it produces gaps. Things that were working well before aren't working so great now. And so something has changed because the environment has changed. It happens. And we know from the classic framework that on the far left, we start with a business strategy. Could be for the entire company, could be for your own team, you know, could be for a very small team, depending on your level in the organization and your purview. If you fast forward all the way to the far right, you're expected to produce a business result or you want your organization to produce a specific business result. And so your great intention on the far left will manifest on the far right, all dependent on the middle part, which is your people part. How well are we putting the people part to work? And what happens when we have gaps is we know we see three consequences from those gaps. In terms of business results, when those aren't hit, that shows up as missed targets. You start to see a red or a yellow light on your dashboards when you wish it were green. The far left, when you talk about business strategy, you think about execution risk. So a leader says, well, what do I need us to accomplish in the next 12 to 18 months? I'm not so sure that we've got the capability to pull that off. Do we have the right people in place? Do we have enough leadership capacity? Do we understand what's required to make this thing happen? Tossing and turning at night, that's an example of, of uh, strategy and execution risk. And then the middle part, which we're seeing more profoundly than we have in a long time, what I call the people tax. There's a tax that we pay when individuals at work are worried and they're in my office and they're complaining about you know, balance and burnout and frustration or maybe another team who's not doing something they need them to do. All that is a tax on my execution, my operation. When I'm not able, uh, when we see uh, communication issues, slow decision-making, these types of things are attacks that are not always calculated, but they're absolutely negatively impacting the bottom line. So this is the example of talent optimization gaps and the problems that they produce. But I share it because that means that a new talent optimization approach will also close those gaps and remove these types of challenges that we're seeing in organizations. So we're gonna take a talent optimization approach when we look at some of the tools and the techniques you can use to offset this great resignation. Now, as a foundational piece, what I like to talk about when working with clients is that the world of work is really broken down into two basic things. What is the work to be done and who's doing the work? These are two sides of the same coin, right? But it's really, really important that we understand both. If you see any issue in your organization in terms of a business result, that's not where you want it to be, or a known people challenge, it's going to come down to one of these two things, um, if not both. And so we have to remember that every business problem is a people problem. I have yet to meet a business problem that we can't trace back to the people issues that are causing it. So with these two questions in mind, what do we need? We need awareness, agreement, alignment, and action. Awareness, oftentimes I find that something has changed and maybe that we don't understand the nature of the work to be done in this given scenario. Or maybe our awareness of who's doing the work doesn't match 
the work to be done. Maybe we don't know enough about candidates who are applying, and therefore we need to shore up what we understand about them. Agreement happens when we think about what's the work to be done if two senior leaders have a difference of opinion about the work that's even needed to be doing in the first place, the chance of success is dramatically reduced, quite obviously. So agreement and then alignment of how do we make sure that who we ask to do the work aligns with the work that we're asking them to do. That's hard enough to do at the individual level when I'm hiring for a single job. Imagine how much more difficult it is when I do it at the team level. Now I've got a group of eight to 10 people working on a complex cross-functional project. Well, what's the work to be done? Who's doing the work? It still holds true. It holds true for entire functions and departments as well as in the entire organization. And that leads us to the last one, which is action. If I know that I lack awareness or there's disagreement or there's misalignment, I have to take action. I have to go back and shore those things up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the world of work with these two questions in mind. What is the work to be done and who's doing the work? Now, fortunately, what we found is that the world of work can be roughly divided into one of four categories. If I start us at the top right around innovation and agility, some parts of an organization require dealing with ambiguity, the uncertainty of the future. Moving counterclockwise, I think it is, Hannah, counterclockwise, top left, to teamwork and employee experience. Now we're talking about employee loyalty, participation, that type of goodwill. Bottom left, process of precision. How do we get things done in a high quality way, highly efficient, highly reliable? Results in discipline is all about driving forward with results and metrics and trying to have a very uh, strict strategy and, and really uh, an intense focus on the business outcomes. So the world of work and the work to be done can therefore be broken up in one of these four areas. And what we also find is that people themselves are naturally wired to accomplish work or, or perform work in one of these areas. And I'll give you an example. What we can do is we can look at individuals and their natural behavioral drives and preferences in the context of this world of work. Here's an individual who's particularly strong at teamwork and employee experience. If you're a longstanding PI person, then you might recognize that promoters and collaborators tend to fall within this quadrant of being naturally good at teamwork, employee experience, employee participation, loyalty, these types of things. When I contrast that with another individual who might be good at process and precision, these tend to be guardians and craftsmen and operators, then you can see that there's some similarities. They're not altogether different, but there are some differences too. And so being able to understand what people are naturally gravitate toward in terms of, of their uh, behavioral preferences is starting to increase that awareness we talked about a little bit earlier here within the team context. And then finally, when you start bringing in the work to be done, these purple arcs indicate dimensions of work that a team might be asked to do. So in this case, you can see a pretty heavy concentration of work that's all about employee experience and teamwork with a little bit around process and precision. And those are good things because these two individuals are naturally suited to that type of work. But you see one more arc over in the innovation and agility quadrant that neither one of them is directly aligned with. And so now we're talking about a situation of either stretch, we need to identify other individuals who are naturally good at it. Everything we've been looking at is part of a tool at PI that we call team discovery. It's a discovery tool to help us understand those two things within the team context. What is the work to be done? and who's doing the work. And this is going to help us really uh, pull these things apart. So what I wanna do now is use that framework that we just looked at and take a look at four examples that I guarantee you are happening right now in your organization. And most importantly is what you can do about it. I wanna show you some of the different uh, vectors or dynamics that I see happening in organizations using that sort of uh, framework and, and tool and lens as an approach. Here's an example. One of the first things is hybrid work. Again, hybrid work is when we have some individuals who are in the office, some who are remote. And you can see a configuration here that is a team. You can see they're relatively spread out across all four of the different quadrants that the work to be done is actually covers all four quadrants too. So we would say this is a very uh, dynamic or a very heterogeneous team. So a lot of diversity in terms of their behavioral styles and preferences, but it's also a very uh, balanced strategy in the sense that there's one of these uh, work aspects in each of the four quadrants. To me, this is the most uh, dangerous type of strategy to execute because it is so balanced. And it's the most challenging type of team to manage because you have so many different personality types. 
Now, this happens to be my team. This is my day to day. So it's okay, you know, no cause for alarm. What you're seeing here are the color coded situations where uh, we have hybrid work at play. The green individuals are people who are completely remote. They, they don't come into the office almost at all. Blue is just the opposite. Blue are people who work, what we call studio, is that they work at least three days a week, if not all days a week in the office physically. And the orange team members are floaters. They come in sometimes, they don't, depending on the situation, the need. Now, MP, that's me up in the top right, Innovation Agility Quadrant, and I'm blue because I come into the office. I'm calling in from the office right now. Uh, so then if you look at the other person who's also color-coded blue like me, comes in the office, her name is Kathy, down in that process and precision quadrant, we have to remember that people make decisions about where to work based on personal choices, not personality choices. So in this case, what I'm saying is that Kathy has decided to come into the office for whatever reason. Maybe she's got uh, 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 needs to do her job that are better done in the office. Maybe she likes something else about the geographic location. It could be any number of things. What I don't want to do is say, just because Kathy has chosen to be in the office, she must want me to come up and just talk to her all the time, unannounced, just pop up to her desk. Hey, what do you think of the game last night? Kathy is a craftsperson. She doesn't want that type of, of unannounced, like that's not a good fit for her personality. So her work format of being here in the office with me is not an indication of, of what she wants in terms of and needs from me in terms of her leader. Now, the same person next to me, Dottie, in green, is somebody who's like me. If you know the, the PI reference profiles, she's a persuader like I am, but she's field. She doesn't come into the office. So I can't assume that, oh, that means she must want me to leave her alone. No, I actually go out of my way with Dottie. I send her text messages. We use a tool called Slack to communicate. I make sure that there's plenty of FaceTime for Dottie, even though she's not in the office, because I know that's what she needs to be happy and complete and perform at her best on my team. So again, the choice of where to work in a hybrid organization like this is a personal choice, not a personality choice. When you think back to my framework of awareness before agreement and alignment and action, I'm taking action to make sure that I don't disrupt somebody who works in the office and that I reach out to somebody who doesn't because I have the benefit of a PI tool set like this. So if you have hybrid work in whole or in part in your organization, I ask the question, do your leaders have this view right next to their monitor? Are they able to understand who needs a special outreach or who needs not to be disrupted? Or are they just doing whatever they feel like going by gut and causing all kinds of challenges in the process? Let's move on to another example, avoiding mishires. So here's an example of a team. Let's say that it was a, a pilot team. There was an innovation and agility naturally suited to that type of work. And the project went so well that now we're extending a couple of the strategic elements down into driving results. We want to scale up those early successes. And in so doing, we've created a gap. There's some work to be done that we don't have natural people who are wired to do that type of work. Good news, we can make a hire. Well, if these are my three candidate choices, A, B, and C, then I have a very clear decision when I think about who to hire, not just in terms only of the job target. That's really, really important. But what I find in complex cross-functional situations is it's the context that kills. It's the context of, of course, the person I hired could do their job, but in the context of the broader team, there was some friction, there were some challenges, some needs not getting met. That's because we didn't look at the entire team context. So in this case, if I hire candidate A, I'm gonna get more of the same. It's gonna be very familiar. Onboarding is gonna go very smoothly, but I'm still gonna have that gap. If I talk to candidate B, it's gonna be a great interview. You know, persuaders and, I'm sorry, uh, promoters and, and collaborators, great to talk to, but it's gonna give me the exact opposite of what I need on my team. And candidate C is gonna be great for the fit of the things that were added to my charter, but it's going to be a little bit of a different personality type that I now have to think about when onboarding and interacting and accommodating their needs as a balancer to the rest of my highly innovative and agile team. So mishires, again, uh, you could hire to the job target, but if we don't look at, at complex jobs in the context of the full team, we could still end up with some, some challenging situations there. Now, here's another example of, of career advancement. What we find time and again is that if individuals are susceptible to leave their organization, many times it's because they didn't see an opportunity for career advancement. In this example, if we look at the purple rings, right, the work to be done, I always start with the work to be done. There was a process uh, in the process quadrant, there was a gap in terms of 
a needed capability around increasing the reliability of products, uh, production and services to avoid disruptions and delays. And that was something that the team didn't naturally have. Now, just because we have a gap on a team doesn't mean that we're always gonna make a hire. That's not the only way to close the gap. We can coach and develop individuals to cover gaps as well. And in this case, I've highlighted in green an individual that the team leader has said, this person has been identified as somebody I want to invest in. They want to stretch in their career. We found a certificate program or an online education or an apprenticeship program, whatever you can find. And they're actually going through knowledge and skills training in this area of increasing reliability production. Maybe it's a project management course, who knows, whatever it makes sense. But you're showing how the stretch of the individual is covered in career advancement in a way that the individual wins because they know the company's investing in them. They feel like they're learning new skills. They're making themselves more valuable, both to the company and, and to their future career. The leader wins because they're covering off on a gap that they have inside of the organization and, and making sure that they're, they're balancing sort of their, their needs without making a hire. So that's a, that's a great thing to do. And the company wins because they retain the individual employee. And maybe down the road a year from now, we want to reassign them to some other part of the organization with this new skill they've developed. So my question again is, do our leaders have this deliberate view of their team, a very clear indication of the gaps? Are they have identified individuals who they're investing in in terms of professional development and skills development to cover off on those gaps? And if I go talk to those individuals, can they explain how they're excited, they have visibility into the career advancement and how they're developing. If the answer is no, then we, we can't continue to be surprised by the great resignation. When a top performer leaves and we didn't have a view like this that showed how we were investing in them and how it fit into the, the broader team charter, th then we can't be as surprised. Uh, the next one we have here is around uh, maximizing readiness. So this is an example when we think about the, um, the team leader here and the likelihood to stay. So when you start looking at the individuals all across the, the, uh, the uh, plotting here, what I've color coded on the left-hand side is an employee who's good to go. Let's say that good to go means that I've had a conversation with them. I've talked to them about their vision of the company, their own future, their career development, and, and they, they're really, um, uh, all bought in and, and I'm, I'm very confident that their likelihood to stay is high. On the fence might be somebody who like, well, I haven't really had a direct conversation with them. And this person hasn't had a compensation review in the last 12 months. And I'd say to the team leader, okay, um, interesting. So what are you gonna do about that? How are we going to have that conversation or have that comp review or whatever it needs? We have to be doing everything we can during this very volatile period to make sure that we're protecting our people. So that's good to know that this person's on the fence. Tell me your plan to, to remedy that situation. And then at risk, this is an individual who maybe they lost a lot of coworkers. They're part of an organization that's really frustrated right now. And I say to that team leader, interesting. So the only person you have who's naturally wired to do process type work is at risk. What are you gonna do about that situation? That's now my top priority for you. Because if they leave, now all of a sudden you develop a three month gap in terms of hiring and onboarding a new party plus ramp time, that part of your strategy is gonna be at risk. So this is all uh, something you can do very informally if we just ask the team leader to say, okay, I want you to go in and show me your team. It's very appropriate to ask that within the context of what we're asking you to do as the leader and within the context of who you have doing that work, tell me where they are in terms of your opinion about their likelihood to leave, right? The other thing is that you see up in the top right, the, the diagnosed product, there is an employee experience survey capability you could use and you could color code based on whether the organizations, uh, you know, the teams of these different people, their reporting structure, and you could use empirical data to go ahead and color code green, yellow, and red in this case. So lots of different ways to do it. But my point is still the same. Can I go to the leaders in my organization and can they show me their team within the context of the work to be done and their likelihood to retain those team members. That's something that's very easy to do. It's a five minute conversation, maybe you know, a little bit more than that for them to prep, but you know, that's what we demand of our leaders. I expect them to know the work that, that uh, their team is doing, and I expect them to have the temperature of their team you know, right at the fingertips. They need to be able to show me, and that's, that's a, a way that we can do that. 
So that was uh, just a, a, a really a brief presentation, but I wanted to turn over to Dave at this point, and, and we're going to do some moderated discussion and Q&A. And I would, uh, again, before we get started with, with just Dave and myself, take advantage of that Q&A. If you've seen something you want some clarification on, uh, let us know. Uh, if you have any questions about your own you know, work uh, situations, we'd love to hear that too. But now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Dave. Thank you. Well, Dr. Matt, thank you again for joining us, and it's always a pleasure to have uh, you with us. And you know, you've got a great bunch of insights for uh, for what you're seeing globally with our client list. One of the questions that keeps coming up uh, when we're dealing with clients, uh, they they really feel kind of um, challenged by the, the the lack of 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 candidates out in the marketplace. There's not a, you know, it's certainly uh, a tough marketplace to find people. And, you know, we think a lot about why people leave. From our research, we believe, and we've seen that people don't leave the companies, they leave the leader. Can you comment on that and, and how maybe talent optimization can settle things down? Because if there are a lack of candidate, candidates out there, then you know the, the people tax on people leaving is, in, is going to become even more expensive. Um, how do we equip our managers, leaders, to stop the bleeding in the first place? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I, I feel like the best candidate is obviously the one who's already in the job and we're happy with their performance. Let's not lose them, right? And I agree with you 100%, Dave. It, a lot of times, what we find is that people are leaving their managers and. What we're finding is that if the manager is burned out, the employees know it too. So one thing I'd say to senior leaders is check in with your leaders, check in with your managers, right? Are they taking time for themselves or are they burned out? You know, and, and make sure that they're at their best in terms of their productivity, their mindset, and, and these sorts of things. And assuming that they're taking care of themselves, that's that's step one. Step two is have they dedicated themselves really to getting the people part of their business right? So many managers were technical high performers as individual contributors who we turn into managers. That's a very natural thing to do, but it's also important that they either are naturally good at, which is very rare, or that they become good at through deliberate investment at the people part. And so what I would say is that if I had to do something quickly, if you put me to task here and you said, I need an answer, I need to do something now. I would say within the PI tool set, my, one of my favorite things is the manager strategy guide. Basically what it does is it takes an individual uh, worker and based on their behavioral drives and, and needs, it tells the manager, here are things you can specifically do with this person to meet their needs. If it's a brand new employee or relatively new, I would give it to the manager and I would say, here's your, your cheat sheet, if you will, about how to lead this person. And that's great. But if it's an employee who's been here for a while, let's say nine months or more, I like to actually use that same asset as a, what I'll call a 180. I give it to the employee and I say, okay, this is how I understand you like to be managed. I want you to fill out and check the boxes where I am doing these things and leave it blank the ones that are I'm not. And let's have a conversation about it. I'm gonna do the same thing independently and then we're gonna compare notes. And boy, the conversation that you can have with something like this, again, it doesn't take long to do, five, 10 minutes, fill it out and let's you know, compare our answers during a one-on-one -on -one that I should be having anyway, is really, really revealing. So now all of a sudden it's like, Oh, it says here that I need to provide you very specific instructions when I assign you work. Okay. Uh, yeah, I absolutely do that. And the employee's like, <laughs> yeah, no, you don't. Well, wait a second. Hold on. Let's have a conversation about that. I thought I was doing that. And, and now you can start to meet their needs and reduce that likelihood of, of turnover that you were talking about earlier. If it gets to the point where you absolutely have lost the employee or you have to make a hire, the very first thing I want to look at is the job description or the job advertisement. Are we accurately capturing the reality of the role or did we just create our job ad by going to Google and, and typing in the job title and copy and paste in, I see it way too often, and just Frankensteining this job description? That's not gonna be the way to attract the right candidate. Instead, I wanna make a very specific and, and deliberate job advertisement that matches the reality of what I'm looking for and that it reads in a way that matches the candidate. Many times I see these highly extroverted jobs with these boring job descriptions. And it doesn't really speak to the opportunity to talk to customers and employees and, and lead up these efforts. And I'm like, you're, you're, you're burying the headline. 
It's like, if this really is a highly interactive communication, highly intensive job, put up a video of somebody talking to other people and, be, and let them sort of see themselves in this role. They're gonna be more excited to apply for your job. So those are some things that, that I would uh, definitely recommend. I kind of went on a little long there, Dave, sorry, but. Oh, it, it's all good. There's a lot of frustration out there and that was very helpful. Another thought that uh, we hear from our clients is onboarding new employees. You know, I was talking to uh, someone this week in the meat sector and, uh, and they have a, a smaller company, but they're doing quite well, foods do. And they're frustrated with how to onboard in this Zoom world. People don't feel part of the team. And so, the, you know, if the onboarding doesn't get done right, they, they, they create a circle of, of challenge. How would you, what would you comment or what, would, what could they do differently in onboarding new employees in this Zoom or Microsoft team world? Yeah, it's really frightening. I've seen some people who feel that if, uh, I saw a headline the other day, it says, if I never met my coworkers face to face, did I ever even work there? And you're seeing that people who take these jobs when they had a virtual hiring experience don't feel the same level of connection to your point, and they're leaving those jobs. And you're like, oh my gosh, I worked so hard to get somebody because I lost somebody and now they're gone too. It's a devastating, uh, you know, to have to start that process again. So when you think about the socialization process of an individual, it's how do we create those, that identity? How do we create those ties and, and connect them and anchor them in something related to the work? So on my team, let's say that I had a new hire. The one thing I want, want to do is make sure that the team that they're going to be working most closely with using a tool like what we just saw, that we go through an exercise that says, hey, this is my philosophy. New team member means we've got a new team. So let's, let's start the process of making sure we have maximum awareness about each individual's uh, strengths and where they complement one another. Let's celebrate those, those differences and let's have a conversation about that and, and be fully transparent about it. Also the identity that comes with it. You know, so my team is known as an adapting team, just like as a reference profile, I'm known as a persuader, as an individual, I lead an adapting team. And so that, that identity that comes from the familiarity of, of, oh, look, as a team, as a collective, we now have an identity is really important. And that's also something to celebrate. And so the tooling that you have, the PI tooling can help you do that. Beyond that, I think trying to make sure that when people get together, that there's a chance to get to know each other through uh, different means, icebreaker questions, uh, learning about each other's uh, sort of hobbies, preferences, habits, whatever it might be, to complement the work that we're going to be doing together. And don't just be all about the work all the time, because there's a socialization aspect that I have to work artificially hard because it's on Zoom versus what it was in, in the office. I want to make sure they meet people outside of their direct teams. I want to use technology to pair them up, or I want to ask my, my counterparts, my peers, other directors and VPs in the company, hey, can you make sure that so-and-so connects with my person? You know, just try to create as many points of contact as is appropriate in a chance to really make them feel a part of something. And the last thing I'll say is swag. It's a term that we use all the time. Send them things. It's, it's awesome to get us an unexpected gift that says, hey, here's something with the company's name and logo. You're part of the team. Let's get on Zoom with a picture. Everybody wear your shirts today. These things matter. They're basic human needs and, and we need to meet them. It's funny. We're finding with, so we hire a lot of millennials and, uh, you know, they're, there's, they're different to manage and, uh, and, club, and, and, a, and a Gen Z, actually. One Gen Z's parent called, called me, actually, and said, my, my son is fantastic. I never saw that before we, you know, we brought him in and, uh, and we certainly managed, uh, but managing with fun seems to be uh, of interest. We did a uh, virtual martini party um, where we, you know, we, we mailed out the martini kits to, to everybody a little hokey and we had great success because we have all of our people virtual across Canada. So there's certainly a need for more TLC to manage your greatest asset, the people. Um, and it's not like it used to be. I mean, you used to be able to, you know, have everybody in and uh, have a pizza party and so forth. So certainly I think we need to be more creative uh, as you pointed out. And um, it, the payback is, you know, you're gonna have a lower people tax for sure. Another question that came to me as I was preparing for this is the challenge or the lack of predictability in resourcing out there. And so, you know, where do we get candidates from? You know, it's uh, 
skinny market. They say that full employment in America is 5%, and we're pretty close to that uh, in Canada and the United States. And so, you know, I'd love to hear your comments on tips or tricks uh, around talent optimization and this availability of talent um, so that we can become more predictable in resourcing. Any ideas on that? Yeah, I think that what happened was we started to see that during the pandemic, and certainly now that we've sort of returned to work and there's been a, a surge of remote friendly situations and job postings, et cetera, it's really dramatically changed the talent pool from the employer's perspective. So if you think about like, um, let's say that I'm in, in uh, um, I'll pick a, a US city, Milwaukee, right? And I'm, a, I'm hiring entry level workers in Milwaukee. Well, in the old days, I used to compete with other Milwaukee-based employers that were hiring entry-level workers. Well, now with remote jobs, I'm competing with anyone in the United States and even beyond who's willing to hire early stage people, early career people who are willing to do remote work. So the competition got a lot more fierce. Additionally, the gig economy, and you think about everybody who's bringing you your food and, and doing all these things, became a viable option as people started nesting. And so a lot of the early career workers are deferring their, you know, kind of full-time job, real job sort of career aspirations while they figure themselves out. And so now all of a sudden they're looking at different sources that they wouldn't have considered in the past. So all this means is that from a talent optimization perspective, your, your uh, need to do things the right way is heightened and your need to get creative when it comes, especially for those really tricky jobs, unique jobs, um, really high, high um, challenging to fill jobs. It has, you have to be that much more creative and competitive. So I was talking to a client the other day and I said, you know, do you have a relocation package? And they said, well, yeah, we'll pay to move people closer to headquarters for select roles. And I said, well, yeah, I'm talking about a relocation package you know, to anywhere. Because if somebody says, I, I'm in this place and now with the pandemic, I'm taking a job, I see you hire for remote work, I'd actually like to make a move to you know, Utah in the United States. I like to do hiking, I wanna be outdoors. Like maybe you pay for a relocation package for them. You know, We're starting to see a lot of reasons why people want to relocate um, and, and you have to be able to be creative about those types of things. So, you know, I think definitely making sure my job description matches the job that I'm attracting the right candidates so that I'm not wasting time talking to the wrong people. And when I get somebody who looks like they're a really good fit, I have to be prepared to pull out all the stops uh, in order to secure that top talent. It's just the nature of the competitive market right now. You talked a lot about three things and I thought it was uh, brilliant. Execution risk, people tax, and missing targets. Can you chat a little bit more about execution risk? Because I, we have a lot of clients out there and we love them. Uh, they're, our clients are the best in the world. Um, but sometimes they forget to do job models. Um, they forget to update the job models. So if you think about it, you know, uh, we hire people, but we forget the job or the work to be done. You know, how great is this execution risk in the, in the whole wheel? Yeah, it, it's significant in the sense that if I if you think about execution risk, I like to talk to senior leaders and I say, think about the next 12 to 18 months. What does your organization need to do, right, to execute your strategy? And if there's some part that keeps you up at night, that is a reflection of at risk, where you're like, I just don't know if we're going to be able to pull it off. Like, I know we need to expand into this region. We're going to open three new stores. But the district manager, I don't know if they're like really on board with me with this one, you know, whatever it might be. That's execution risk. So when it's forward looking in the sense that it hasn't happened yet, call it 12 to 18 months, whatever's appropriate, depending on the size and the stage of your company. And you think about that, that execution, it's, it's a, really a, a big part of, of what's needed to be successful. If you lack awareness about what's needed, that's the place to start. If we have awareness, we need to move into agreement. Does everyone understand it like the same way? Do we understand exactly what's needed in terms of changing our capabilities? You just brought up a great example, Dave, when you're we talking about you know, Gen Z. If we decide that we need to expand dramatically this part of our business, let's say call center, some other entry level job, we're gonna be hiring a lot of new Gen Z people. Well, the strategy risk is gonna be if we don't start to be clear about why our company uh, and our mission is really important, we're not gonna attract those candidates. We actually have to change how public we are and how we take a stand about sustainability, uh, the impact of our organization, why the planet is better because our company is in it. You know, these types of things are important to Generation Z and to these entry level workers. So that's an example of, of strategy risk that is born if we don't you know, take that into account. 
So it's like, if we don't have awareness, that's a problem. If we have awareness, but we don't have agreement, okay, it's a lesser problem, but still a problem. And then alignment is all about how do we make sure that we've got the right people in place for the forward-looking strategy. We saw a couple of examples of gaps that were created on that team discovery chart, those examples I shared, based on evolution. And right now, strategies are changing so rapidly because the environment is so volatile. They call it volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. These are the types of things that reflect today's business climate. So strategies are changing faster than ever. If you think about you know, purchasing a vehicle, vehicles today are just electronics on wheels. It's unbelievable what has happened in that space that had been around for more than a century, but it's totally different now. And it changed those strategies, you know, relatively speaking, overnight. So that, that's my, my ob observation there is that the same tried and true process and methodology I shared earlier is still at play. Think about the next 12 to 18 months. Can you say that across your executive team that everyone has awareness of the people implications of your strategy, that everyone's in full agreement as to what needs to be done, and everyone is under, uh, clear about the alignment that needs to take place to make it a reality. If the answer is no, get to work. What about the, uh, the challenge that we see where um, sales are not at target? We had a, a discussion earlier uh, this week. We did the team discovery uh, of the sales team and they were all in teamwork. Uh, and we know that, you know, when that's a risk because it's single digit growth and there was no innovative people on the team. That seemed to be that visual uh, when we presented it to the CEO was a come to Jesus visual. visual. Um, I think team discovery is new to a lot of our clients. Um, I really believe that populating the data in those four quadrants uh, can be very compelling as to, you know, what is it? that we need and what is, you know, why is our strategy not being executed? I was on a, a call yesterday with uh, Selling Power and it was, a, they're a sales organization. They have a magazine. And the statistic that they raised was that only 8% of the sales reps, this is shocking, were at 100% or more of quota in, the la in, in this year, in this last 12 months. And so I wonder, because a lot of folks on this team are looking to accelerate sales, you know, sales and, and team discovery and analytics, how well do they go together and, and how well can they equip for tough discussions? Yeah, very well. I, I feel like not all sales professionals are created equal in terms of their uh, personality drivers, their, their values, their cognitive abilities, like all these different things. And, and not all sales demands are, are the same either. Some products are less complicated. Some situations require team-based selling. Some are brand new products or services. And sometimes you find that your most successful sellers historically are hesitant to introduce new products and services to their existing installed base. So it always comes back again though to what is the work to be done? And I think that um, if you were to say to me, well, what about a team of, of uh, teamwork and employee experience sales professionals? I'd say, well, depending on the context, that might be okay. I, I, there's not as many of them perhaps, but it could be okay, but it's likely not if, and if the sales results aren't there, it's probably because the sales work to be done is actually quite different. It's either a new product or service, in which case innovation and agility people tend to perform better, or it could be a, more of a complex technical sale that requires, you know, sophisticated work with solution engineers, et cetera, which starts to get you down into results and discipline. Um, if it's more of a team-based sale and more of a relationship selling and indirect through a channel, Maybe that's when you start to see teamwork and employee experience, you know, come in only in severely regulated industries. Do I see sales professionals with a process and precision background really succeed? So um, knowing the work to be done is, is never going to steer you wrong. It's just not. And uh, many times we think, well, all salespeople are the same. I'm going to talk to them and they're going to all do the same thing. No, that's, that's not true anymore. Hasn't been for a long time. Great. I see one of the questions that came in through, uh, through our team uh, of, of listeners today. Monique, thank you for this question. And I, and I want to read it because it's a really important one. How do you enforce employee accountability without forcing them out the door, especially in a tight labor market like we've got today? It's hmm. a great question. A lot of times with accountability, what I find is that we have to allow, are we, are we really sure that that's what we're looking for? We, we want them to be accountable for what? the authority to make decisions, the authority to take specific actions. 
Are they comfortable doing those things? Have we made it psychologically safe for them to fail, right? Um, so there's a lot that we can do in terms of making sure that accountability, that the door is open for them the right way. A lot of times, you know, I talk to leaders who will say, I want my people to be more accountable. And I say, well, what's the last major decision that you let this employee make? And they're like, oh, well, yeah, because we're under such pressure to make the number, then I usually have to step in. Okay, well, then you're training them that you actually don't want them to be accountable. So you shouldn't be surprised at what you're getting. I, I think that understanding their natural drives and capabilities, we never want to set people up to fail, but we want to stretch them. But if I'm going to stretch somebody in terms of have, having them be more accountable, how can I do it in a way that's safe? If they don't feel safe and I'm just saying, hey, look, I'm going to hold, you know, have you be accountable for this, they're going to struggle because it's kind of a mixed message. So I would say that uh, how do I enforce employee accountability? I make sure the conditions for accountability are appropriate and, and, uh, and proper. And then in terms of enforcement, I think being transparent about it and making sure that I'm providing the coaching and feedback in line with their behavioral drives is important. If they're a super dominant person, I'm going to talk about, hey, your name's on this. If they're a super extroverted person, I'm going to say a lot of people are counting on you for this. If they're super uh, process and precision oriented, I'm like, there's a way we do things around here and I'm counting on you to uphold that. Like there's ways that you could connect it to their natural wiring. It, uh, but again, all that other stuff I said before is still true. We've got to make the conditions for accountability appropriate. Uh, Dr. Mack, can you put up the four box model again? Just uh, I have a thought on that one. And that four box model was, um, was designed. Can you give us a little bit of the science behind the you know, we just we just didn't pull this out of our back seat of our uh, of our Chevy. What what is the science behind the four box model? Yeah, there's there's a couple of different uh, well researched frameworks, including one known as the cultural values framework that really I'm sorry the competing values framework that really starts to look at individuals and teams and organizations and culture and a lot of uh, science that goes into personality and and social science behind it. And so we we had to go and and develop new science in order to help us understand team dynamics. So we did that. And in the technical manuals for this type of part of the product, you know, you can get into that, that type of science. But if you're a PI practitioner of, of uh, longstanding and you, and you look at this, generally speaking, I'll give you the shorthand, on the right-hand side of this equation, let's call it the right hemisphere, you're talking about people that are very naturally proactive. They're A over C people. They're really high dominance, uh, low patience people. They're gonna have that bias for action. By contrast, the left hemisphere is made up of the opposite, responsive people, right? So high patience, but low dominance. And that's the types of people. And that's how we ended up with, with the personality types and the reference profiles I shared earlier. At the top of this, we start to look at that, that uh, extroversion to formality relationships or BD, right? So you end up with people who are more informal in the top hemisphere and people who are more formal and by the book and more uh, structured in their communication and, and their interactions toward the bottom of the, of the lower hemisphere. And so what happens in this framework is that the more, statistically speaking, the more, uh, the wider your pattern in either of those two dimensions, it pulls you out toward the outside. So people like you and myself, Dave, we have a little bit wider patterns. We tend to be more out toward the outside of these rings versus toward the inside where people are either have narrower patterns or, or these types of things. So yes, it's grounded in science. If you're familiar with the PI behavioral assessment, you're very familiar with those factor combinations that give us proactivity versus responsiveness and informality versus formality. That's how it generally pulls people apart and characterizes and classifies the work to be done. Yeah, I love that model because a lot of uh, leaders, myself as one, like simple visuals. And this can be done for a team of 10. You know, how do I plug into this? What's the job to be done? I, a question that came up about values uh, and accountability. and I'm going to to flag out our youngest employee, uh, Michaela, who was on the call. She challenged me when she first started. She's an intern with us and she's doing a great job, uh, Gen Z or Gen Z, as we say. Um, but we, we didn't have our values shared as much as we should with all of our employees. So we created, as you guys have in Boston, a values chart. And I think that an, an accountability, just to, to go back to the accountability question, I think it's three things. It's the vision, it's the values, and it's the job to be done or performance metrics. And so a lot of uh, uh, leaders, uh, this is a little bit non-PI, but the values that you have 
can be linked into uh, this, this wonderful matrix. Could you comment on that? Because every company should have their list of values. We've got seven. I think Boston has seven. What, 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 how could we bring values in to increase accountability uh, with managers and employees? Yeah, I think it, it really creates this, this um, interaction, if you will, between the values of the organization and the drives of the individual. So what I always want to do when I'm working with employees is that they understand the cultural values because those are organization wide, right? So in our case, we talk about teamwork and honesty and, and all of our values. They, they spell out a, a, a phrase called threads. And so we talk about our threads. Those are the values they, they tie us together. And so um, what I want to do, though, is make sure that we can see within the individual's personality drivers and their behavioral drives, what does it look like in terms of teamwork and being a good teammate? And so there's an interaction between values and behavioral drives that you know, we can talk about at the individual level and even at the team level. Like if we have a team that's what's called you know, a, um, a, an exploring team, so naturally good at innovation and agility, well, how can I be a good team player when I'm out smashing through walls and trying to break things? Because that's my job. But I want to make sure people are informed and not surprised. So maybe we talk about how to accommodate that in line with our values as an organization and in line with the work we're being asked to do and who we are. So that, that's how I look at that, Dave. One last question, and then I'll turn it over to Hannah. I'm sorry for occupying so much of your time. Is a lot of companies out there are looking to win new business. We've got some consultants on the on the call today, uh, boutique companies. Um, how would we use this to acquire new business? I mean, uh, if my team is uh, making widgets are really strong in technology, and I'm approaching a, a company that's very innovative, uh, how would you do that? I mean. I like the work that Eric Irwin did on our team. Eric Irwin secured a contract with Amazon. Uh, Amazon was having a trouble getting the last mile drivers um, in the Western New York area. So they're very innovative. And Eric Irwin approached it with, look, you need people that will be drivers that are very process and precision. They're not like you. Uh, and this is what a path. Pattern looks like, and it really helped. But how could our partners use this to acquire new business? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. So it's it, that goes back to what's the nature of the work to be done. If the work to be done requires process and precision type people, that's who we want to attract. I think that the point you made about simple visuals just can't be overemphasized, Dave. The reality is that business people are very busy. HR professionals, as we said earlier, are under siege. We don't need you know overly detailed flowcharts and, and spreadsheets and all these kinds of stuff. What we need are simple visuals that are very powerful. I want a lot of bang for the buck. And I think that in this example, if I'm approaching a sales situation and I can demystify something with a simple visual, that's important. I like to take job descriptions on a company's website, for example, and start to show on a grid like this, well, here's where this job is reading. Is that right? Does that feel about right? You know, you've got a lot of teamwork and employee experience statements in here. And they're like, oh, that's interesting. I was really shooting for something and more in innovation and agility. I'm like, well, it's not coming through the job ad. So maybe we should talk about the job ad before we go talk to a bunch of candidates who are a bad fit. Excellent. And my last question then, Hannah, I promise it's over to you. Uh, the hybrid world is, is here to stay. I see TD Bank today has declared that all of their employees are staying uh, were remote until January, 2022. Um, What's your read on uh, on the work worlds uh, for the next six months? Yeah, I think it'll last well beyond six months. I think people have had a, a taste of hybrid work. I think we've demonstrated that productivity works really well. I actually consider hybrid work to be the most dangerous work format we've ever seen. And the reason I say that is because if you go before the pandemic, most organizations were in person. Then we sent everybody home and it was still a level playing field. Everybody was at home. And so we made it work and we basically translated what worked before to what worked now online. But now some individuals have come back and some haven't. I'm a leader. I've got five in the room and five on the Zoom. And what am I supposed to do? And how do I ensure equity? Like nobody has those answers. And that's what makes it such a dangerous work format. So we were kind of lulled into this sense of like, oh, we can do this because we all did it when we were remote. Well, yeah, but now that some are back and some aren't, how do you avoid bias for the in-group versus the out-group? How do you sort of ensure that type of equity, even in a given brainstorming session? So I think there's a lot that has to be done with it, but it is absolutely here to stay. Even when the pandemic subsides, that could be years, who knows when that's going to be. 
this, the reality is that the appetite, it was an accelerant and the appetite for hybrid work will remain long after. This is just the new normal. This is just the next normal, whatever you want to call it. We've got to get good at hybrid work. And that's true on the way that we work and the technology we do. Yes, absolutely. But it's also true in terms of how we manage our people. That is just as critical. Great. All right. Uh, Hannah, I'll just turn it over to you. I, I could keep talking to Dr. Matt for, for hours. She's, uh, I feel the same way, Dave. I feel the same way. Certainly. And uh, thank you for helping us win the big contract with Walmart, by the way. I'm not supposed to say that, but I just did. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, Hannah, over to you. Thanks, over Dave. Here. No, that was a, this was a great uh, segue, actually. We did have a one question from the audience that I just want to make sure we get time to answer before we wrap up here. Uh, but that was a good segue conversation, and you kind of hit on a few points there, uh, Matt. But this person says, I love what you said about the difference between personal choice to come to the office and that it's not necessarily based on personality in the example you shared earlier. Do you have any advice on creating a plan to go back to the office where flexibility wasn't the norm pre-pandemic? And how do you manage employee expectations surrounding that? Uh, yes, I, I would say that transparency is your friend. The one thing is that we, I, I use a phrase with my team, I say all of our work is done in the broad light of day. And by that, I mean, we've introduced specific technologies that allow us to be transparent. So we may have, for example, a team charter. What is the team trying to accomplish? We have that in a shared Google Doc. We'll use technologies like Miro, which is an online sort of sticky note kind of tool if we're doing brainstorming. And we share those things as broadly as we can across the organization. We shoot a lot of videos to basically say, hey, we just had this meeting, everybody. Here's the decision that we made and why we came up with it. Here's who to contact. Link here for the details. Transparency equals trust. And so in a, in a situation where we're going and we weren't fully remote before, but we want to move to that now, I think that, that we've got to have unprecedented levels of, of that type of transparency if we're going to have trust. The other thing that we have to watch out for is that if all of your senior leaders come back to the office and a lot of your um, uh, more kind of uh, entry level and, and uh, first line managers are remote, that's not a good look. It's like, oh, well, if I really want to get ahead, I have to be in the office. So that's not equity in that case. So you have to, it's, it's kind of the things that you deliberately set as policy, like we will be transparent. And it's also the things that are a little bit more subtle, but it's the unspoken word and, and what you're saying. So I think you have to get both sides of that equation right. Great. Okay. Thanks, Matt. All right, so before we wrap up here, uh, just another thank you to our audience. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as a thank you for joining us today, we would like to offer everyone uh, on the call a one hour dream team session. This is valued at over $2,500. So this includes five free uh, behavioral assessments, a one hour dream team session with your consultant, um, one free team and some read back. So there's a lot of value there. Instead of you emailing me to let me know if you are interested, I'm going to launch a poll right now. Uh, so just take the time to answer that. If you'd like me to follow up with you about uh, this, just answer that there and I'll make sure I do. While you're answering that, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Dr. Matt for joining us today. I think this was a really insightful session. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dave, for your great questions as well. Thanks so much well, for having I, me. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to have Dr. Matt with us and 